Welcome to another Confluence podcast. I'm Randall Stevens, joined as usual uh, by Evan Troxell, and our guest today is Charlie Portelli. Welcome, Charlie. Uh, I'll give a little brief intro and then let you tell more about the kind of work that you're doing. But uh, I met Charlie. Uh, he participated in our Confluence event that we held in Brooklyn, uh, New York, uh, back in April and gave a great presentation. Charlie works with Perkins and Will. His title is a digital innovation strategist. Uh, our theme this year was all around machine learning and AI. So Charlie's working on a team of people at Perkins and Will uh, around, you know, strategies. Uh, and uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. So welcome, Charlie. Thank you. Thank you, folks, for, for having me. Your, uh, the title of your talk at the Confluence event was uh, AI in Practice. And you ended up uh, kind of walking us through, you know, some examples of how you're thinking about um, about using mm -hmm. machine learning and AI techniques at Perkins and Will. Um, I know, you know, one of the things that you kind of kicked that off was, was just the challenges with uh, so much unstructured data. So maybe we can just kind of kick it off there. You can tell us a little bit more about what your all's team is thinking about and uh, let's just dive in. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, when this whole sort of um, data topic came, you know, sort of relevant to our industry, you give, you give or take like 10 or so years ago, you know, buildings equals data and so on. Like the folks at Case kind of coined that phrase. Everyone's like, yeah, we have all these models and we have, you know, Revit files and spreadsheets and yada, 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 whatever, right? We can do something with it, right? Um, no. <laughs> it's it's highly unstructured uh project teams change um there's not sort of like a really rigorous as rigorously as you'd like it to me it's not a really rigorous sort of kind of follow through on projects people on projects turn over and so on so we have in our industry a lot of unstructured data and that's that right so Obviously, the more structured, from my, this is now my personal opinion, obviously, the more structured it is, I feel like um, it's easier to, to kind of implement and use right away. Uh, the more unstructured it is, the harder it becomes to, to use, right? I just kind of think of my, my own personal life, like the more structured things are, it's easier to kind of understand where things are and how to find things, right? Um, and with data, my mind kind of thinks very similarly. Um, with that being said, you know, so how do we clean all this stuff up, right? How do we actually make it usable? So we've been looking at, um, for example, naming conventions of spaces and rooms, right? <clears throat> and one example I brought up um, during the presentation was like a restroom, right? So the I minute mean, I say restroom, we already all know what, we, what we're thinking about, right? There's, there, there's, a, there's a toilet, there's a sink, um, you know, if it's a uh, person, if it's a residential, there might be, a shower, a bath, and a bathtub, or something like that, right? And then you can start to think about, you know, other names like toilet and uh, wa water closet and so on and so forth, right? And if you have kids, potty, right? Like, you know, that's sort of the thing that, like, peaks my ears when my kids are like, I gotta go potty, and you're, like, in a public space, right? Um, so, you know, how do we kind of clean all this stuff up? So what we've done is that we can queer all this stuff via the API easily, right? And what we could do is now take this, run it through uh, OpenAI's API, and essentially start to kind of unify it, right? So from like a space naming convention, we don't have to with kind of force rigorous standards um, on design teams, right? Um, and a reason not to do that also is kind of clients uh, have their own sort of naming conventions for, you know, conference rooms and workspaces, breakout spaces, you know, communal spaces, that sort of thing, right? right? So we just work within the client's domain uh, and naming conventions and so on, sort of their brand and their strategy and all that. Um, and then we can scrub all that data, kind of unify it, clean it up, and then we can run some analytics on top of it, right? So that's sort of one way we're looking at sort of cleaning, cleaning data. Kind of, you know, it brings up uh, the point that, you know, we talk about when you're working on these things as far as data and structure versus unstructured, but really behind all of that is his language. How do, how do, how are people thinking and talking about these yeah. things? Uh, you know, the, the world of design uh, architecture and design and engineering, you know, there are strict 
there aren't strict standards on the way that we do that. So I think that's, you know, it, it, it makes sense that it's really, uh, things are named the way that we talk about them and that we, the way you talk about them may be different with whoever the client is, or even the different, you know, especially a firm the size of Perkins Will, you've got a lot of different people from a lot of different backgrounds. So the, even their language, you know, so I think it's, uh, it's interesting to think about that. Um, you know, I think maybe 10 years ago is your example, when everybody was talking about data, everybody would start talking about standards. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the reality is you're never going to get everybody wow. on that. So to the idea that we can now leverage this technology to say, no, I can, I can let you talk in whatever language you want to talk in, mm -hmm. and I'm going to translate that, which I think is a very powerful way to think about it. It even comes down to building codes, which is something that came to my attention uh, on a personal project. So in New York City, if you have a kitchen that's less than 80 square feet, it's not a kitchen. It's a kitchenette. Mm, yep. And that's like a building code thing. And if yep. you label your plan as kitchen and it's less You're than 80 square feet, it will actually get rejected. Flag. No, red flag. <laughs> It'll get flagged, right? So <laughs> it's like some, some of these things are outside of our, our control, right? So we just sort of kind of work with it. There's right? that side of it. And then there's the architect side of it, which yes. is like, I will name a room or a space a certain label just so it doesn't bring up a red flag right so to to your it's or or because it's political in nature in that organization right so we we won't call that space a storage space we'll call it a a flex space or something like that where it's yeah. like that that might be a terrible example but but the idea is like architecture is all about the exceptions when it comes to these kinds of things because i mean that's that's basically what, what we're doing with the building code is finding the exceptions so that we can achieve some certain goal. And that goes against this whole idea of quote unquote standards. And, and yeah. every time you bring up standards or naming conventions, the hairs on the back of the architect's neck raise up because it's like, well, yeah, they're all great. Mine is the best. Right. And, yeah. and, and so you, you can't have a discussion even in an office about standards because every team has their own. And I think it is particularly interesting to think of this set of tools as a way around that, right? Mm -hmm. Number one, architects are all about workarounds, right? So this is a fantastic workaround to the whole standardization of things. You're, you're using a tool and a large language model to take all of the possible things you can call something and funnel it into a single thing which then allows you to do that proactive analysis to it. I think, like I always bring up like drywall as an example, right? There's one yes. name for it, then there's gypsum board, and then there's plaster board, and there's gyp board, and, and everybody in, in several details, I mean, Randall, you probably see this all the time, at Avail, details on a sheet will call the same thing different things in every detail because they're pulling from some standards library where there's no standards on the terminology for those things because it's such a manual labor kind of a, a thing to go through all those details and standardize that and it doesn't always even fit on the line right so we we start to yeah. abbreviate things and i mean it is kind of a mess so this is a really interesting way around this problem in our industry I, i'm pretty fascinated by this as a, like who saw that coming right because everybody was attacking it from the other way around which was the ground up it's like now we have to manually go through everything and change everything and basically what you're saying is nope we don't have to do that anymore yeah no don't, don't bother and it's funny you bring up the, the topic of standardization and so on i remember um in a different lifetime i was working at a different firm and i was talking to one of the partners and he made a comment, he's like, the idea of standardization and innovation are sort of on the two opposite ends of the spectrum, mm. right? Like, if you're oh, constantly yeah. working within standards, how can you, you know, put yourself in a place where you're constantly innovating, right? Um, so they're, they're sort of opposed to, to one another. So mm. we've kind of found a way to keep working the way you work, <clears throat> and then we will just kind of clean this up. And we've done it in a way where uh, it's actually not that much effort which is nice, right? We're not going in renaming things. We're not going in breaking projects. We're not going in copy projects into, you know, a template file or some nonsense or any of that, that stuff, right? Um, so maybe you can talk, Charlie, how, you know, as, you're, as you all started out just by looking at the data and doing the analysis of the data, how is that, how are, how are you all now, how is that manifesting itself back into either productivity enhancements or, you know, what are the manifestations of that now? to the designer, design teams uh, at their desk. Yeah. 
So it's still sort of a work in progress, right? I think uh, when I when I did the talk back here in New York, I called it building intelligence um, or intelligence in practice or something like that. And I think it was, it's a play on the word practice, right? Because we're we we have a for architecture practice, but we're also practicing how we can kind of put this to use, right? So it's all sort of um, a work in progress. So we have spaces, right? We now have a way of kind of grouping them by naming convention, right? So cafes in various projects, now we can start to run queries across all of these things, right? Um, what we're looking at is uh, by sort of standardizing the naming convention and, and running these queries, we could start to understand Okay, so you have a hospital of X thousand square feet. How many cafes do you have? What's the typical, you know, cafe size? What's the typical equipment in a cafe size of, of that sort? Um, and we can start to flush out very quickly sort of um, a jump start on a project in a way. So I need to start a project. I need to do uh, uh, science and technology lab. The performa says it needs, you know, this amount of wet labs, this amount of dry labs, this amount of clean spaces and so on. Help me flush this out very quickly and help me, you know, mass it out quickly, right? Um, just to kind of put something on the paper and then we can start to massage it, you know, more and more, you know, as the, as the, uh, the project evolves. That's sort of the direction that we're going. Right. So I know you have a, start. I know you have an architecture background yourself and a, a lot of what we try to have and I try to, you know, as we get people like yourself onto this podcast, we're, we always try to dig into like, well, what was the, what is the process of going through this? So can you maybe talk to us a little bit about, you know, if you're, if you're like us, you kind of start with putting a stake in the ground, you'll kind of dream up what to use the tech for, but talk to me about how do you all actually engage design teams in this process and then say, here's what we're able to do and then get their feedback in that, like what would help you? Can you kind of walk us through what that process looks like at Perkins and Will? Yeah, it's very dynamic. Um, and that's sort of kind of my way of saying it's not standard, right? So there's some folks within that. any firm. <laughs> when you said you know, that, I was like, oh, that's a nice way to say that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a dynamic thing, mm -hmm. right? So. At any firm that I've ever worked at, there's sort of, you can kind of group folks into almost like three categories, right? There's the people that know what you do and know how to leverage what you do, right? And you work really well together. And sometimes you work so well together that you have to spend little time working together because you just churn out results and everyone sort of moves on. There's the opposite end of the spectrum, the people that have no clue what you do and have no clue how they can engage you. Um, and then the in-between group that know what you do, but don't understand how to engage you, right? Um, so depending on those three, that's why it's a little bit of a dynamic situation. Um, so I go to the office frequently, um, and even though my team is remote, when I, when I say remote, you know, my team is in Boston, Poland, Copenhagen, Chicago, you know, so on and so forth. They're all in different offices, right? Um, even though I have no physical reason to go to the office, I go to the office, I interact with designers, I talk with them, I give presentations to the office and so on. So that's one method of engaging folks. Uh, I guess there, I guess there, Charlie, just a, a question about, is your team, is it viewed as a, a services group within Perkins Will that can be engaged by any of these teams and you have to go out and kind of sell your services or what you all can do at, versus how much are you all proactively kind of generating things on your own and then trying to push it into the firm. Yeah. I mean, it's both. Just, it's both. Yeah. We, we tackle it from, from a multi-perspective view. Um, so there is my, my co-lead. So I co-lead the IO group. Yes. Uh, my, my colleague, Thomas Kearns, he's based out of Chicago. Um, and he focuses more on the, on the services side of things uh, so much so that some of those services actually become externally facing client facing services and so on. And he's kind of leading that, that effort. I'm sort of more leading the internal side of things. And now you, whether you want to call it still services or not, you know, open that open for everyone to interpret. Um, but we do, we do talk to project teams. Uh, we do talk to folks within the office, you know, leadership folks, but also people on projects kind of, you know, in the trenches and we kind of express to them what, what can be done, what, what are you doing? How can we help out and sort of thing? 
we keep it very open. Um, it's also a way of kind of understanding more and more how projects are evolving over time. Um, I've slowly have gotten pulled out of projects over the years. Um, and that's necessarily, it's not, I think being on projects once in a while helps out, but it's hard to kind of do everything. Um, so we do engage in a lot of different, different ways. Um, I try to do it at a grassroots level because like, those are the folks executing the work. Those are the, uh, the folks that are going to see immediate benefit. And if they see immediate benefit, then the project sees immediate benefit as well. But then there's also sort of larger initiatives um, that we're working on that kind of the whole firm will see. Themes. Themes, yep. yeah. Yep. Can you talk maybe about like even around as you all began to look at how you could structure this data, was that presented back to to some of the practitioners in the group and what kind of response did you get from them as you started to show them the kinds of things that you could do? Oh yeah, no, hundred percent. When, when we gave that presentation, we actually, I forgot if it was the day before or after, uh, my colleague was from Boston, came to give the presentation with me, the available presentation with me. So while he was here in New York, we also gave that same presentation to the New York office and we gave it to a couple other offices and it was, it was well received. It's still one of these things where they, they, it, it's, it's sort of, um, a light at the end of the tunnel in a way. So we're not just there yet, right? We are thinking about being able to jumpstart a project, but because we can't do it and we can't, you know, put it on someone's desk and say, here, next time you have a performa, you know, click these buttons, you know, it's hard for folks to, you know, grasp it really well. Like you can, you, you look at like a new car that comes out on the market. And until you drive it, it's hard for any one of us to say like, oh, it really drives really smooth or, right. you know, it has really bad throttle response or something like that, right? Um, so until someone actually gets to test drive it, there's always sort of like, okay, that's nice. What's next? Okay, that's nice. When can we use it? So mm -hmm. we're working towards that. Yeah, it's almost like, you know, my experience has been, you know, yours is within a large firm, ours is two, two customers like you uh, that we service. It's... You know, we f we have the same challenges, which is I I don't do what you do every day, so I need your input, I need your feet, and mm -hmm. it's almost like you have to find uh, somebody with almost a personal interest in it. We, we, uh, that the way you described it as light at the end of the tunnel is a really good way to say it. When you you know you show them something and then their wheels you know yes. start turning, which is usually what the people kind of uh, the, the do what we do. Uh, you know, we're always imagining, and then you see what sticks. It's like okay. I've got to go out now and have a bunch of conversations around this. I've done enough to yeah. hopefully uh, get your wheels turning, but uh, it's really hard to find people that, you know, that don't want to just say, let me know when you're done, you know, and, yeah. and engage in that process. So I don't know if you've got any, any tips or tricks that you've learned in doing that within the firm. Uh, but uh, I like all the stuff that I've done that I, I feel like is successful are things that or part in the firm, but external. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain. So in a, in a different lifetime, uh, you know, I started my career kind of as kind of like a computational designer within a firm and I kind of worked more on projects and, and I touched them more. But I would go to, I would play soccer with them on Thursdays. I would go to the happy hours. I would go to uh, the softball games. I didn't play softball, but I, I'd just go. Um, so we did a lot of that sort of socializing and you give any architect a beer or two and they just start writing on like <laughs> all the issues they're running into. Right. Yes. <laughs> and I'm one of the few people that'll say, you know, I want to hear your complaints because that is an opportunity for me to make a change. Mm -hmm. um, so I can tell you like countless times how on a Thursday after soccer, be at the bar and someone would complain about something. And then Friday morning, you know, we stagger into the office and I start, you know, churning away. And within like a day or so, I was like, here, install this and let me know what you think. And they'll be like, oh, this is great. What can I do X, Y, Z? Or right. no, this isn't what I was talking about. What can I do this? So the iteration that you do as sort of like a, a you know, um, a, a software provider, you know, it happens only so fast because you're kind of an arm's length away, but within a firm, we're literally desks away. So that churn can happen pretty fast. And within a week, you can have something that's on someone's desk, you know, lightweight, nothing crazy, that, you know, made them happy, 
right? Yeah, you, proves, you proves, at least proves the concept out, right? Yeah. So we, yeah. uh, I just was out in California uh, visiting some customers in the last month, and, you know, anytime I'm in, in their offices, I'm always asking, what else would you want this to do? What, what, what else problem could it solve? And it's like, taking notes, and, uh, you know, I just had a call the other day, Kate brought one of those back, engineer coded it up real quick and you know we were on the call with them and tell them about this and all of a sudden we were sharing the screen they're like oh my gosh you've already coded it it's like yeah if you'll you'll tell us we'll go you know but it's it's like pulling teeth sometimes to get that well, uh, they're all conditioned to, get, to deal um, with uh, the people who don't listen to the, <laughs> the companies yeah, who maybe, who build maybe, software yeah, who them. actively ignore them as the audience right so we're we're nobody, nobody knows yeah, what we're talking you, about yeah. You have to be a little bit careful that, you know, you can, yeah. you know, if it's, if it's pie in the sky and, you know, all that kind of stuff, but when it's small things, especially small efficiency things that can be like, um, you know, added, you know, quickly to kind of tools that you've already built. It's like, okay, thank you for spending the time to just explain it to me. Right. That's all it took for us to go like, okay, yeah. we can actually go add value in this way. Yeah. Charlie, totally I have a question for you about the, about your your latest AI endeavors, and, and you've talked about light at the end of the tunnel, so you provide kind of this vision in your presentation, and I'm sure there's some something somebody could start doing right now, but but maybe you could just talk about how a tool like this would, would work. So you talked about giving somebody kind of a great kickoff for their project. How would they interact with with a tool like that? How do you see that working? Is it is it still very large language model kind of chat based or is it more of a an app that they run and they check boxes and something comes comes back to them it's 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 sort of evolving right it's and it's kind of my other word versus dynamic it's evolving um <laughs> so we when you, we have looked at the kind, kind of like chat based kind of efforts and we've showed some of that during our presentation in new york uh, being able to query a model and say you know so in this hospital how many restrooms are there so you can get a sense of, okay, so a hospital this size has this many restrooms or something like that. Or how do you get from, you know, uh, from the pre-op room to the op room uh, in a hospital, right? What are, what are the stages, you know, the cleaning and all that other stuff, right? Because in some places there's, in some projects, there's, there's some, some sequence of a flow. Airport is an, an obvious one, right? Like you, you check in, you drop off your bags, you go through security, and you go to your gate, right? Like that, that is a one way sequence. And anytime anyone breaks that one way sequence, um, you're either escorted out the building or you just, you know, didn't, people just don't like you, all right? Uh, having to go back through the security line and, and, and delay people. Um, so, from a chat based perspective, you know, we've tested that and it can, and it can work, right? Um, with regards to sort of like the app based, you know, sort of options and clicking mm -hmm. and so on, uh, that's, that's something we're looking into as well. Uh, we have the ability of doing a quick search and navigating kind of the spaces and understanding elements within spaces and that sort of thing. Um, there's no sort of final, nothing's kind of finalized yet, uh, but as sort of as a grand scheme, I can envision this moment where a client comes, is awards a project to the architect and says, okay, this is my performa, this is my budget, you know, as architects, we have to design within that performa and within, within that budget. Right. The performa sometimes can be detailed, sometimes it can be a little vague. Um, if you're working with, like, for example, a hotel, you need X amount of hotel rooms. And this is, you know, the specifics of each hotel room, you know, the, the king suites and, you know, so on and so forth, right? Uh, you need so many numbers of, of these rooms, right? So the goal would be to kind of see, use this performa as sort of like a... Uh, the, the, the initial point of feeding this application that will then kind of take that and say, okay, based on past projects that are a similar size, this is sort of kind of the breakdown and the setup that you have. And then also we would kind of feed in the building lot. We've worked on projects where before where they gave us a performa and we tried to put that performa on the building lot and said, hey, it doesn't fit, it doesn't work, right? It just can't. We got within like 98% and like we, we just can't get the other 2%. So there's moments where the performance isn't 100%, you know, up to date. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea is to kind of take those two things, you know, the property and the performance and feed them in and, and basically get a rough block model, rough. I, won't, I don't want to call it massing, 
because I don't want it. I want I don't want folks to think that it'll take away from their creativity. But a bubble diagram of sorts, right? Say these are the spaces. These spaces need to be adjacent to one another. This is ballpark size of the spaces based on you know um, usage counts and that sort of thing, right? So very quickly, bubble diagramish of um, of the building. It seems too that like when you upload that performa or program or whatever you want to call it, right? It's like there's some kind of analysis that could happen that says we've typically done these kinds of spaces when this is the majority of the program. Here's what's missing kind of a thing. Because that happens too, right? Yes. We get we get programs and it's like there's just stuff Forgot that's been operate, omitted, right. not on yes. purpose, but it just wasn't wasn't there. And if you and so then it just becomes more of a conversation back to the client, right? So it's like, here's some prompts for you to take back to the client and talk about these things. It just seems like it kind is. of a natural progression of a something like this. 100%. Yeah, the less sexy side of kind of this whole uh, endeavor that we're looking at is essentially a QA, QC mm -hmm. process, right? And saying, okay, so we have this plot of land and these are all the spaces and so on. And typically for a pre-op room, you have these pieces of equipment because you need to you know the surgeons need to prep themselves to to go into um into the surgery space but your space does not allow for all these pieces of equipment so you need to kind of rethink this and it's less about having the application kind of try to automate rethinking it and more about flagging it to the designer right um anything anytime a, a per i feel like a person's pulled out of the process uh, it, it, it opens it more for distrust and errors, yeah, right? So right. Yeah. keep the designer engaged as it moves on. Right? Yeah, I think you, you brought building codes earlier too, and, and this is where things I think could get really, really interesting, right? It's because maybe a couple more steps down the line from the program stage that we were just talking about is when you actually start to come up with the stacking diagrams and the adjacencies and all these things. And that's where the building code plays a huge part in this because you could choose a certain construction type and you could choose to sprinkle your buildings and you could have certain size side yards on projects which provide exceptions, right? And so depending on occupancy types, types of spaces, you can see where this just leads to, and I, I talked with Shane at, or not, it was Scott at Upcodes a long time ago, right? And it was like, well, what if you could if it could give you questions that you need to ask yourselves, your design teams, your clients to say, okay, if I choose this construction type, it allows me to do this. But if I choose this construction type, it allows me to do this and this and this. And then that becomes a decision point that you have to make. Like it's not going to make it for you. Right. And so it is inclusive, but it's also prompting you to things you may not have been aware of um, just by making a decision like that early on, it has huge impacts on the outcome of the project, what you can do, how many floors you can go, how big your areas can be, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. And this is architecture, right? Every municipality out there has some weird adoption of the building code. You know, there's, yes. there's something like 30,000 municipalities and they all have a different recipe of the codes that they are using right now. And so that becomes part of what you're feeding potentially into the system to say, okay, this is the project, this is the location, this is the code cycles that we're going to be using, these are the codes, and here's the program. And it, it just seems to me like there's a, there's a lot of opportunity here to, to be that co-creator along the path of, of the design phases. Yeah, 100%, 100%, I think. And it's, you know, the designers still having that kind of control and sort of being sort of you know, made aware of some of these things. The other kind of sort of reason behind some of this is not, not to just automate and speed things up, right, and, and allow designers to do more, is that there, there's, there's a lot of macro decisions that are made on projects, and there's a lot of micro decisions made on projects. Um, I argue that the macro decisions are actually quite easy because they're usually done by committee or there's some really um, hard and fast rules of, like, this is what we're doing, this is why we're doing it, right? Whereas uh, the micro decisions are things that designers do at their desk on a day to day basis, right? And if these errors of the micro decisions start to kind of, well, once they start to add up, you know, they, they can lead to rework and, and things like that. Um, and a lot of times to solve these micro decisions, you have to go to the senior person in the office and says, hey, you know, this is the condition I'm dealing with. How would you address it? Or this is what I'm facing. Do you have any ideas or any you know, precedents of? 
projects that we've done in the firm that can do this and so on, right? That if anyone's worked in an office before and from the junior level, OAF, right, you come to realize that that senior person isn't always available. It's because they're working on many things, they're traveling, you know, we all have lives, we all have priorities, and, you know, everything needs to be addressed, right, from, you know, addressing client needs to addressing project needs and so on. So if we can have this setup that can allow for, you know, dealing with some of these micro decisions, right, we don't have to worry about kind of veering off too much off on the mark, right? Oh, someone missed, you know, these rooms here. This is undersized or, or something like or oversized, you know, and then you have to go through a VE exercise, which is sort of like blasphemy, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, Microsoft probably got it right from a branding standpoint of calling their stuff Copilot because it seems to be a natural kind of way to think about these kinds of things. You want some some little co-pilot doesn't mean there's still not another part of the process, but you'd love to have somebody right along, another personality right along with you, maybe that knows a little bit more about certain things and, and can be kind of push you in uh, certain kinds of directions. And that's what a lot of these discussions end up. It's a very natural thing to think about. It's not going to, it's not the end of all. It's not going to make all this yeah, stuff, sure. but it's going to help kind of guide me and propel me and push me, challenge me, help me. Do all those kinds of uh, those kinds of adjectives. yeah, and it's all it's all about me as the architect, right, as the designer, and not necessarily taking me out of the picture, right. And sometimes I even pull back from the idea of co-pilot. The idea of co-pilot means that there's someone else there that if the pilot can't navigate, the co-pilot can take on. Right. So you know, I, I I I kind of even step it down a, for, a bit further and say it's a, it's an assistant, right? Like yeah, so, this is going to it's going to help assistant. me, right? Yeah, and you're, yeah, you're right, and and that that's an example where language matters to somebody. It's like, are you going to get pushback from this, or is, is it your assistant, or is yeah. it this you know equal? And it's like, well, they're not equals. It's, uh, well, one of the things uh, uh, I know, Charlie, when you were presenting, um, uh, you know, at the New York event, we've talked a lot about the data side of it, and where you all started around trying to you know put some structure to all that, but you also talked some about. Um, how you're using, looking at the image generation. I know you all were experimenting with uh, putting some new front ends. Uh, what was that tool called Com Comfy UI or something that you're putting in front of Stable yeah. Diffusion? And maybe you can talk a little bit about that side of it. Um, you know, uh, geometry generation and or image generation and, and where where you all see this. Yeah, the image generation is sort of uh, like low hanging fruit. It's a no brainer at this point. And almost everyone is doing it. Um, we generate so many images in our, in our industry that it's, it's again, it's a no-brainer, right, uh, to kind of allow you to kind of iterate very quickly. You do have to kind of read through the fine print of who owns it and what's your sort of contractual agreement with your client and, you know, all that other fun stuff, right? So do, do talk to kind of counsel about all that stuff um, and user license agreements and all that. All that. Um, but yeah, so we, we are using Comfy UI um, for image generation. We can take screenshots out of Rhino, for example, of a massing, and we can kind of very quickly iterate ideas on top of it, right? Um, so that's kind of nice and handy. We can apply different styles to it and so on, and we can use that for, um, for presentations and so on. We've gone through the fine print, right? Um, it's all run locally. So none of it is cloud-based, right? So there, we're not breaching any security requirements that clients ask us to, to abide by, right? So that's totally fine. It's not feeding back into, um, you know, global models and, and so on, right? So it kind of, which is still kind of like an open question about like IP discussions and all that stuff, that's beyond me. Um, so it's, it's a safe, playground it's a safe environment that yeah kind of iterate play around with and so maybe you can maybe you can just kind of uh, since you brought that up i think there's probably still a lot of um i know we talked about it at the event but you know it takes a lot a lot of data to train a model and a lot of the kinds of stuff that we're talking about doing is not really training models we're using existing models to then exercise on local data uh, in the example. Maybe you can uh, kind of talk a little bit about that, even 
you know, even at the scale of a Perkins Will, one of the largest firms in the world, do you all ever perceive that you'd be able to have enough data to even train your own model? Or is it always going to be to leverage these large models, you know, public models and, and execute? Yeah, something with it? I think our current, um, our current sort of consensus is, is more the latter. There are a lot of models, they're trained on, you know, probably trillions of images, who knows, right? Um, and we're going to sort of just use those right now because, you know, they're definitely more robust than we feel like anything that we could probably put together. Now, there's other firms that argue differently, right? I've seen presentations by other firms that say, um, hey, we can, you know, we've trained our own model and yada, 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 and so on and so forth. And, you know, Godspeed, I think uh, certain firms have very specific styles that can lend yeah. themselves to that. So then it, it almost as if it's building a heavy bias into, um, into that, which is good for them because, you know, they want to generate images based on their style. And and then so like the Frank Gehrys of the world, the Zaha need to have a very yeah. you know, kind of iconic style. Exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, so things like that. So that's sort of where, where we are and how we're looking at it. Um, and, uh, it's kind of where we are today. Nothing saying we may not train our own models on our own images and so on, because we do generate a, hundred, a bunch of images regularly for projects, but to be determined, right? Um, as it gets easier to do some of these things, it might be easier to train our own models and so on, right? Yeah, I agree. I could, I could, I could see that evolving, but I think the current state is it's it takes a lot of data to train a model and, and even at the scale of a yeah, right. yeah it's expensive and that's why you see these comp the the main the large uh, organizations spending billions of dollars for you know and that's usually uh compute time it's like it takes and that's just because they're ingesting so much information um but uh yeah i think it's a uh, i think a lot of what we're going to be talking about over the next next couple of years probably is just educating, helping everybody understand that when we're talking about, you know, putting an image in or asking it to do something, we're not training a model. We're just ask, we're using the model to do some effect exactly. on top of the data that we're giving it. And, and that, you know, you have to, you have to dig into what's really going on to start to understand and to build a mental map about what's going on. And, and then that gets into the overcoming the fear. We're not, giving our intellectual property without going into, you know, the, the engine that's, you know, another firm's going to now be able to, you know, yeah. or something. And even that, that, that sort of intellectual property is kind of, you could probably have a conference on just that alone. It's, right, right. So it's kind of open and, you know, once an image is put out there on the internet, it's, you know, can, it's accessible, right? So sure. sure. Whether they train it beforehand or after the fact, you know, whatever, that being said, an image is an image, right? You still have to build the building, right? Like, so you still have to detail it. You still have to get fabricators involved. You still have to get all these folks involved. So just because you can you know, generate a new Gaudi building doesn't necessarily mean that you're actually going to be able to, you know, build it. Um, yeah, build so on. It. So it takes, takes more than just that. The interesting thing about this whole movement with AI that we've been seeing is this idea of regurgitation, right? Like the, the, things tend to get more and more watered down as the the thing the the information it spits out then goes back in to train it yeah. even further right depend with a little bit of feedback to maybe push it in one direction versus another but it's the same with images right it's like if you train it all on your own images you are regurgitating very similar ideas and sometimes projects call for that right it depend it depends is is an answer that you'll hear a lot when it comes to this stuff like should i use should we train it on ours? Well, it depends. Do you, like you, you want options, right? When you're a designer to, and you want inspiration sometimes, sometimes you do want the fastest path down the road. Sometimes you, you want to take the circuitous, you know, scenic byway to, to start to inform your ideas. So I think for, for a lot of people, they're looking for novel ideas. And we saw this very early on with, what seemed to be pretty exceptional prompt engineering, right? Which was a facade made of feathers and 
like people just exploring weird mashups that you wouldn't normally have done. You would have never taken the time to design something like that before because of how tedious it would have been <laughs> to model and texture and light all of those things. And so in the pursuit of novelty, I think it was it was pretty phenomenal, right? Because it's not just trained on buildings. It's trained on images, right, across the board. And and then it's taking that and, and using your prompt to kind of guide it and come up with, with novel things. And I think that that is what it caught everybody's eye. It's like, whoa, what? Because nobody would have taken the time to, to figure that out or, or to do the, the manual labor to actually do that earlier on. But but this whole idea of training your own model on your own things, it might just be too far down the regurgitation path as well, right? Mm-hmm. And and if architecture is usually, I mean, I I guess I really can't can't say usually, but let's just go with it for a moment, right? It's like it's usually look in the pursuit of of new fresh. I, I mean, that's w- what we do when we practice. We're looking for fresh ideas, and it is a practice. Like we are continually evolving and getting you know, going, going in different ways. And so uh, it, it is something that I think firms need to think pretty deeply about because it does cost a lot of money. And do you want to spend all the time to do something like that so that you can just come out with the same architecture over and over and over yeah. again? I think that's something you kind of have to ask. Yeah, no, 100%. And I think um, it, it, you know, it, it helps take a step back and say, you know, this was all trained up in data on, on the internet right now. I'm not going to get into like truthfulness or not any, or any of that nonsense, but there was a point in time where we were all taught not to believe everything that's on the internet, right? So, come on, like, we should also be, you know, vetting a lot of this that, that comes out our way, right? Not every image on the internet is true, not all the text on the Im- internet is factual, or it might have been factual for that state in time, but then research evolved and led to believe that actually with the modification in medicine and so on that like now this is like the, the more modern fact and modern treatment for a, an ailment or something like that right so something may be factual for its own period of time and evolve so like we we have to be a little more we have to remember it's artificial right so just keep that in mind so from uh you know with your head down working on these kinds of things every day charlie what's uh what's what's got you excited what do you what do you kind of foresee as you know, something over the next six, 12 months that you think you're going to be working on that, that, that keeps you excited. Cause you know, a lot of times you're probably, you're probably a, a year or two ahead of kind of what people are, are able to, uh, you know, even put their own hands uh, on. Let's see. Hopefully. Right. Um, I don't know. It's hard to get excited these days. There's like not much. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mean that in like any like sort of condescending way or any facetious way or anything like that. It's just sort of like, Anyone can easily get excited, and I think that's probably one of the big problems is that there's so much flashiness and all this stuff that, like, anyone can easily get excited. And I think that's probably, like, if you think about the the Gartner hype cycle, um, I was explaining it to our intern earlier today, I think that that excitement is, like, anyone can easily kind of jump on that bandwagon. And I think it's cutting through all the fluff and seeing sort of the real potential to it. I think that kind of excites me. The pragmatic side yeah like i mean anyone can make a pretty picture and it's actually gotten way easier to make a pretty picture now right but the problem is can you build the building right because i've worked on a lot of projects prior to you know this this wave of ai prevalence in our in our industry and some of them didn't get built but some of them did get built actually quite a few of them got built um and those are sort of the exciting ones. Like I go for a run in the morning and I run past one of my towers that I built. And I don't, it's not like I'm waving a flag saying, hey, I built this or anything, but it's just right, something right. for me like, oh, yeah. I remember those facade panels. I remember those stack joints. I remember the, the BMU tracks and all that other stuff, right? Like, so we do have to build, build buildings, right? We're building them for, for humans, right? Um, so if we kind of can't build these buildings, right, then, then we sort of, that's like, what's the point? So I look at that pragmatic side of it. In terms of like what gets me excited, I think, you know, this this effort of being able to quickly jumpstart a project and have sort of a design assistant running with designers, right, in conjunction so that we can be a little more intentional with our efforts, a little more informed with our efforts. Part of this is not just, you know, space requirements and so on, but also material requirements. You know, Evan, you talked about 
what if we use you know concrete versus steel versus timber or whatever right? those are not just quantity um you know uh significances but also spatial you know considerations have to be taken into account concrete you can only spend so much steel you can spend so much timber you can spend so much and so on right like so being able to understand material quantities and now if you understand material quantities you can start to take into account carbon embodied carbon and so on and so forth right so that kind of excites me being able to stitch together a lot of these things um or the, these topics that we take into consideration but right now it takes a lot of mental effort to kind of stitch them together like okay we have a concrete building how much concrete do i have well i gotta go figure it out okay which concrete supplier are we using well these are the ones that the con the contractor are recommending and the engineer recommends a specific psi so we have to kind of do a lot of legwork to really get to where we are um or where we want to be so i think if we can cut down on a lot of that legwork that's that kind of excites me a little bit right and you know, we can be informed about our decisions and if the client says change the building from concrete to steel we could say okay that could be done the implications are this much co2 spatial requirements change you know so on and so forth Mm -hmm. Which has happened. I've worked on a project where we went from oh, oh for sure, <laughs> from one material to another. Yes, right. If I if I remember right, you kind of posed the question uh, when we were all together uh, at this event in April of you know for the group how how is AI going to you know affect both you know the profession the the person do, you know working in this profession. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, the individual versus the, the career uh, of that individual versus the profession as a whole. So I, I think a lot about what you just said is like those are positive directions for the profession. You're going to be better stewards of resources, energy, all those kinds of things around the problem solving. Uh, maybe you can, um, you know, what have you seen with the work that you're already doing or are you far enough yet to kind of understand how at an individual level that these tools are going to help, you know, an individual in their career? What, 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 what I, maybe a question would be, what advice would you give to an architecture student today about what they should be thinking about and doing because of what, what's going to, what the profession is going to look like in five Ooh, or 10 years? That's a hard one. Um, and it actually should be stay nimble, you know, stay nimble kids. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it actually should be an easy question because I, uh, yeah, I teach, so I should be like, you know, teaching folks in the future. future. But um, it's tricky. I think, um, it, and it also really depends on, on on sort of their career path, right? Whether it's a technology career path, a design career path, or a technical career path. So, it's, so it kind of, I think the staying nimble is definitely sort of key. Sort of being able to ask the right questions um, is important. Um, kind of like what is your end goal um, keep that clear and be able to kind of find a path to get to that goal um, because today you know we, we do what we do as architects 20 years ago I doubt that architects were taking into account the amount of operational carbon and embodied carbon that goes into projects I doubt architects were taking into account, you know, the reusability of the building, uh, repositioning of projects and so on. There was always presentations where they said, oh yeah, and you can scale your building up this way, or you can, you know, expand this way and that sort of thing. It was always within the same typology, right? Here's an office building, you know, you could bigger office building down the road. Here's a residential, you build a bigger as things down there. Sort of thing. And now we're in a position where we're realizing that, um, things can change quite significantly. So being able to kind of wrap our heads around that more um, is, is going to be critical. The architect of the future is going to be able to do more than we can do today. Something you said earlier, Charlie, I think would also be great advice, which is how you went to the soccer games and went to the bar and hung out and asked a lot of questions, right? And like that the idea of just being curious and, and Randall, you spoke about this too, right? Visiting clients in LA when you're, when you're brainstorming ideas in Randall's case, or when you're just trying to get at like what people hate about their job, Charlie, like for an example, right? It's like, like what pisses you off about the practice or the technology or this part of the design process or whatever. I mean, that, that to me, 
shows that like you always want to be learning about something right and and just the ability to ask questions and be curious i think a, a lot of times architects are trained in a vacuum to solve the problems and figure things out themselves and it's amazing what you can learn when you listen right and and ask good questions if if you're just trying to advance your career then you're doing the same thing to a more senior person right you're asking a lot of questions you're trying to figure out why they would make a decision in this particular instance versus you know a different decision in a different instance right so i think when it because because it goes against the way that we're trained which is heads down figure it out get it done and and you make a lot of decisions without any input in those circumstances you get out into the world right every project is a team sport every project involves multiple stakeholders and and there are a lot of people doing it who know a lot more than you do right and so it's it's always going into these situations with an open mind with a lot of curiosity asking great questions to real people and then listening to their answers and and again i think architects are are often in the position of having to have the answers and and that i think is something you want to be very careful about is is just again being open minded and curious to find out why you may not know the best thing and if even if you do know you don't need to spurt it out you don't need to just say it <laughs> um, to stop the conversation i think a lot of times keeping the conversation going is going to be a lot more enlightening uh, and and get you somewhere great than than if you just simply accept what somebody says and say that's the answer let's move on to the next thing so maybe there's a time and place for both of those but i would just i would err on the side of curious and openness oh totally 100 percent. and it, it i was sort of forced into that sort of method of thinking more deeper than method of thinking when i was a product manager at a, at a tech startup right so i was doing this sort of internally at a at an architecture firm but because it, ma it made sense to me it was sort of common sense and then when I worked at a tech startup, you know, I realized I was doing that already, but I was really kind of, like I said, forced to go deeper down that path mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. not making assumptions, but really kind of um, fleshing out a lot of these uh, hurdles that people are running into and sort of kind of their, their sort of what, they, what their kind of goals are and how they want to work. And then it's also work kind of fleshing out even more so like, how often does this happen? Right. We again, we, we, I used to get a lot of one-off requests, like, oh, I'm working in a project mm -hmm. that's like X, Y, Z, can you help me? It's like, all right, so how, how, how often do you run into this? What's, what's the situation sort of, because it's also understanding how did you get to this state where you're in a kind of jam, right? For lack of a better word, you know, and is the solution a Band-Aid just to get you to the next hurdle, you know, taking the same baggage with you? Or should you rewind and find that point where you got on the off-ramp, you know, accidentally and kind of get yourself, you know, course correct and kind of progress forward, right? And it, all, it also depends on time of uh, for developing the solution, and, you know, so on and so forth. Or if you give me two days, I'm going to give you a two-day solution, right? If you give me two months, I'm going to give you a two-month solution, right? And be course correct and everything. And that brings up a good, a good point, Charlie. Like, I think the assumption with the, you know, uh, applying technology, you know, to the industry is it's at least started a lot of it is talked about as, as efficiency gains, automa automating mundane tasks or things that, you know, you would have had to have manual, a person would have manually done, I guess. Uh, and uh, I think it's largely true that that's happening. I guess a question that we have to ask though is the assumption is, is that's going to free me up to do higher order kinds of things. Is, is that true? Are you, are <laughs> uh, short answer? No long answer, possibly. Right. Like, so if I can, if I can automate a specific task that now takes an eight hour task and break and brings it down to six hours or seven hours, it doesn't mean you get to go home an hour early. Like, right, it's right. not gonna. It's not gonna really flesh itself out that way. But maybe you get to think about the project for those two hours in a different way, creative. Correct, one hundred percent. Right. So you can you can now look at things slightly differently, right? And that's where sort of analytics kind of helps, kind of take the coin and be able to see it from the other side, right? You can now build projects with 
more agile teams, more informed teams. I was talking to my intern this morning and I said, one of the projects they work on, which is it falls in the top 10 tallest towers in the world. At one point in time, there was only five of us working on it. Right? So like five people built or helped design one of the tallest skyscrapers, right? And it's because we had like a really flushed out system, right? Um, we were able to do more with less. So architects are gonna be able to do more. When I say do more, they're gonna take into account considerations like material quantities, carbon, where are the materials coming from, right? How sustainable are they and so on? Um, how do we reposition the building in the future? Design for disassembly, right? These are all topics that are conversational right now and we're trying to take into our practice that weren't before, right? So as we, as a practice evolves, we're going to do more we were probably going to have to do it in the same amount of time. I think, uh, you know, one of the things that you kind of wrapped up with when we did the, uh, the session in April was, you know, kind of posing the group uh, around the implications of this technology of whether you want to be a driver or a passenger, right? And I think it does come down to kind of attitude about this, positive attitude, like, I do want to automate away the mundane things so I can work on, you know, whatever you perceive as the higher order things or the more important things. Um, so anyway, I think, I think that's, uh, probably a good, a good analogy or a good way to think about it and, and why, you know, if you just want to go to work every day and keep, you know, spending eight hours, filling those eight hours with the, uh, the way they used to do it, or do you want to pose ask that question of, could, could I make that go yeah. away? Right. Do I need to be the one doing Because I'd rather be spending my time doing something else. So I think it's a good way to think about it. Yeah. Then, I'll put a plug in here for a recent episode I had on Troxel Podcast with Shane Berger from Woods Bagot. When we addressed the topic specifically about what happens to those newly found hours that the, uh, the automation or the efficiencies gained created, and I won't spoil the outcome of that conversation because I would love it if people would listen to it and then, and then provide feedback on it. But I do think that that is something firms need to think about is how they w are going to use those hours and, and what, what is the best use of those. And, and there's a whole gamut of possibility there, right? Uh, so architecture has, has often been uh, you know, in the column of uh, we just do more stuff, right, in those hours. <laughs> we, we've, we've always fallen into do more stuff, but that's not the only option, right? And lots of other uh, verticals out there have shown that, that there are other things you can do with, uh, with the efficiencies gained that, that the tools have provided. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes for this episode so people can, can listen to that. Um, but but that, yeah, not I do think that's an interesting topic to, to ponder. I just want to say, you know, thanks again, Charlie, for uh, participating, you know, at the live event in uh, back in April. And you're going to be coming to Lexington here this fall and participating with us uh, for the three-day Confluence event that we have here. So looking forward to that. It's always, uh, you know, it, uh, it, I don't want to uh, diminish that, you know, it takes time to do these kinds of things. And, but I think for the industry sharing and being able to come on and talk about these kinds of things in the way we do is uh, uh, so why I do it I feel like it's an important part of the service to the industry to propel things I learn every time I have uh, you know that I'm around you know uh, people like you Charlie and the members of your team about what you are doing so uh, much appreciation for that yeah, and the feeling is mutual I mean having events like the ones that you hosted and the one coming up in the fall you know we're all we're all in this together in, in a way right yeah we're competing for new projects and so on right I get it but you, you always hear a lot of folks talking like, oh, I want to move the industry forward. I want to move the needle forward, right? But if you keep it all internal, right, you're, you're moving your firm forward, but you can only move as fast or as much forward as, you know, some of the people other in the, in the industry as well, right? Like to really collectively move, everyone has to have like, you know, these large initiatives and kind of share ideas and share thoughts and so on, right? It's still up to designers and so on to go out and win projects and design beautiful buildings and all this other stuff, but we have to collectively do it, do it a little differently, right? Great. Well, I think that's probably a good, good way to end this. Again, thanks for coming on and sharing your thoughts. Looking forward to uh, 
an update in September when you present at the next Confluence event. And uh, Evan, uh, as we were talking about or before before we went live, uh, probably be seeing several people out in October in San Diego area around the Autodesk University. So a bunch of us will be out there for that as well. A lot of good stuff coming up. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. Great to have this conversation with you today. Appreciate you. Likewise. Thanks, folks.